this time with working microphone. Hello again, everyone. Um, like you noticed, there's been a difference in time. Um, I actually stopped recording because I'd done the most of the next section and the recording crashed. So I had to uh, figure out where my sheet was. I'm pretty sure it was in this state. Um, I had to go all the way back to the third video <laughs> Because apparently in the last video, I didn't go over to this side of the screen except to do a little bit of combat with some lame people. <clears throat> As we were, you wake shortly after dawn to the sound of snoring dwarves and the low hum of the Skyrider. Gathering your equipment, you climb on deck to find everything in shadow, for the Skyrider is hovering beneath a massive outcrop of sandstone that juts from the side of the mountain, thousands of feet above the valley floor below. Banadon stands at the helm, but he's no longer in a trance. Cran riders, he says, pointing to the, to the sun-bleached valley beyond the shadows. They arrived with the dawn. You stare out across the alien landscape, a mountain valley filled with pillars of massive and precariously balanced boulders. The Vasagonians call this place the Coos, the Needles. The rocky columns reach so high into the sky that an avalanche seems unavoidable. Perched upon two of the columns are Cran, their Drakarim riders, scouring the valley with telescopes. An hour passes before they take to the air and disappear. Trim the boom sail, Vosanorim, orders Banadon, his voice barely audible above the increasing hum of the Skyrider. We have a fast run ahead. They're just making silly words that are hard to say for the sake of having silly words that are hard to say. Bastards. We do not have a black crystal cube, and it's a damn good thing. The voyage through the Coos is breathtaking. The Sky Raider glides between the towers of rock that rise from the valley floor with a fantastic and unearthly grandeur. Far below, sulfurous hot water bubbles from fissures in the gr orange ground, and streams of hissing lava carve circular channels, which glow like motes of liquid fire. You watch the sky, but there are no signs of the enemy. Ikarish, says Banadon pensively, the eagle's lair. That is where we'll find Tipasa the Wanderer. It is the place of his birth and the home of his family. He roams the dry main, but he always returns to Ikaresh. It is late afternoon when you reach the hills beyond the coos that overlook the town of Ikaresh. Banadon moors the Skyrider to a pinnacle of stone, and a rope ladder is lowered to the ground. It has been decided that you and he will enter Ikaresh on foot and locate Tapasa, while Nolrim and the crew wait in hiding for you to return. The sight of the Skyrider hovering above the mountain town would be sure to arouse unwanted interest in your arrival. You and Banadon prepare yourselves for your mission by staining your skins with brown copala berries and dressing in the gray and white robes commonly worn by the mountain people of this region. You bid farewell to Nolrim and set off across the barren hills. Pick a number from the random number table and then go to 383. Oh. Okay, then. Huh. I don't... Have I... Hmm. Anyway, I think I remember... I think the other way is just a sidestep. Anyway, without the breeze of the speeding sky ready to cool you, the heat of the mountains is almost unbearable. You trudge across the loose, reddish sand. Your face is covered to keep the dust from choking your throats. All that seems to grow in this desolate wasteland is the wire-hard grass that tears at your boots and leggings. As you reach the outskirts of Igresh, you pass a small round hut where a goat is eating from a manger by the door. A man appears in the darkened doorway and bids you welcome. He touches his forehead in a salute of friendship and invites you both to enter his humble home. Eh, seems reasonable enough. The man is short of stature, but broad-shouldered and strongly built, physical characteristics common among the tough mountain dwellers in Vasagonia. He pulls a cork from a bottle of lime-green wine and pours three large measures into earthenware cups. Kurusha! he exclaims, and downs his wine in one sift gulp. Well, uh, hospitality and whatnot. Uh, let's follow his example. Despite your misgivings, the lime green wine tastes delicious. A warm glow radiates slowly from your stomach, filling you with a comfortable sense of well-being. Restore to endurance? Not necessary. The man looks delighted by your reaction to his wine and offers to sell you a bottle for five gold crowns. If you wish to buy the bottle of Kursha, uh, it's basically a four-point healing potion. Which isn't bad, and we can always use more of that. Uh, I don't think we need this prism. I think it's one of those red herrings they talk about. Nope, four. So we'll hang on to that. We have plenty of healing stuff. Um, let's ask him about Tepasa and see what he knows. Ah, Tepasa, he replies thoughtfully. He lives near the Duga Market. 
but exactly where his home is, I'm not sure. I haven't seen old Tipasa for years. If you should find him, remind him of Kamshim the goatherd. He still owes me twelve crowns that I have not forgotten. You thank the goatherd for his help, and bid him farewell before continuing your trek to Ikaresh. You follow a path along a dry gully, the bed of an ancient river that once flowed through the mountains. An arid breeze blows eddies of red dust along the banks of dead earth. The white-walled buildings of Ikaresh suddenly appear, and as the dust settles, you find yourself standing in a small square close to the open archway of the town's east gate. Perched upon a tall basalt monolith in the center of the square is an eagle, the emblem of this mountain town, cast in bronze. Three bronze arrows are held in its beak, each indicating an exit from the square. Last time I went straight to the Dugga Market. This time I want to go to the Avenue of Eagles, because it sounds neat. Uh, the delicious smell of freshly blue- brewed jala wafts from an eating house halfway along the avenue. Chattering voices mingle with the clink of glasses and the wailing cry of a hungry baby. Oh, let's go into the eating house. This seems like a nice place. Inside the eating house is full of townsfolk, all seated at small stone tables. Ornate hubble bubble pipes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Add to the colorful atmosphere as the smokers discuss all kinds of matters. A quarrelsome trio of Ikureshi are lamenting the death of the old Zakan. Others give voice to various grievances, calling their new leader an ox, a brute, and other such names. In your opinion, they speak too highly of him. Two rough-faced Ikureshi bid you welcome and invite you to share their pipe. These are very friendly-seeming people. We will take them up on it. The smoke is cool and fragrant. Oh, I forgot to lower my crowns for that. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for your hosts. Their long coats of Duga hide are perfumed with a musk that holds no appeal for its sum-lending nostrils. A young girl appears with a tray full of steaming jala cups. One crown each, she says, as she places a tray upon the table. Oh, why not? We're mingling, we're mingling. 237. The jala tastes good as it smells after your dusty trek through the hills and is a welcome relief to your parched throat. Restore a point. Do you know where we may be able to find a man called Tipasa the Wanderer? asked Banadon, successfully hiding his Northland accent with the expert mastery of the Ikareshi dialect. I am sorry, friend, but I have not heard of this man, replies one of the men. You would be wise to ask the widow Soshila. There is little in Ikareshi she does not know. Where can she be found? At her tavern, of course, they reply simultaneously. Cross Eagle Street, you will find it on the way to the Doga Market. You thank the Ikareshi and leave the eating house. Retracing your steps to the square, you set off towards the Doga Market. Seems like this is where they want us to go. Anyway, forty paces along the street is a barracks, a long whitewashed building with ugly square windows. A soldier sits dozing in the evening sun with his spear resting across his lap. Some children are tossing hollowed-out Lernuma fruits at him. Those are the fruits that saved our lives in two, trying to catch them upon the tip of his spear. Opposite the barracks is a tavern with a line of sidled, saddled dogas tied to a rail near the main door. The braying of these sand horses rivals the sound of revelry drifting from the tavern door. Hmm, those could belong to anybody. I don't want to think that there's outriders from the capital here, but I think we've already derped around enough and put ourselves at enough risk. Let's head to the market. You pass under an arch where two brass-gilded conical towers gleam like gold and enter a marketplace crowded with squabbling merchants. Exotic carpets, brightly colored material, and all manner of foods are being bought, sold, and haggled over. The north side of the marketplace is devoted to the auction of dogas. The sleek but noisy desert beasts are being paraded, for the benefit of the bidders, around a paddock adjoining their stables. Just past the stables, a street vanishes into Carpet Weaver's Quarter of Ikaresh. Uh, uh, where'd they say she lived? I don't know. Let's ask somebody. Why would merchants kill? Care. <clears throat> anyway, a small, heavy-set merchant is hawking his wares from a stall set close to the archway. His small, beady eyes twinkle from beneath a ridiculously outsized turban. As you approach, he launches himself at you, desperately trying with a flood of wild claims to persuade you to buy his obviously inferior goods. He looks surprised when you interrupt him with your question. Tipasa? He answers. Yes, yes, I know where he lives. He holds up a gaudy waistcoat of pink and orange sackcloth and offers it to you. It would make a worthy gift for your esteemed friend, 
he suggests, his eyes continuously glancing at your belt pouch. Only five gold crowns, master. You realize we will first have to purchase this ridiculous garment before he will give you any information. Fine, it's not like I need the money. Sure. The merchant's face beams with joy as he pockets your gold. Deduct it from your chart. The first alley on the left past the stables. He lives in the house with the blue door. You hurry across the crowded marketplace towards the stables and enter the street beyond. As you turn into the rubbish-strewn alley, you see the blue door facing you at the end of the passage. There is no reply when you to your first knock. You are about to knock again when the door opens a few inches and the red-rimmed eyes of an old woman stare out from the darkness. Banaton! she exclaims, her voice hoarse and shaky. Thank the gods it is you! She ushers you both inside and locks the door. The house is sparsely furnished, and what little there is is either damaged or broken. They have taken him, Banadon! They have taken my husband! The men with the faces of the dead! Ten days ago, they came like shadows in the night! She breaks down, her frail body racked by sobs. Banadon comforts her as best he can, but you sense he shares her bitter loss. The Dracarim have taken Tipasa. Of that there is little doubt. By now they will have made him tell everything he knows about the tomb of the Majan. We will find him, I promise, says Banadon, wiping the tears from the old woman's face. But you must try to help us if you can. Tipasa always kept a diary of his travels. Do you have it still? A flicker of hope shines in the old woman's eyes. Yes, it is here. He told me to hide it when the evil men came for him. She kneels at an empty fireplace and prizes a loose brick from the chimney. A leather-bound book drops from its hiding place into her hand. She gives it to Banadon, who studies the yellowed pages, his face lined in thought. You notice that the book is full of cryptic symbols, numbers, and pictograms. They are drawn by the night stars, says Banadon, tracing his finger along the astronomical drawings. They hold the secret, I know, but without my star charts we cannot hope to find the tomb. We must first return to the Sky Rider at first light. There, I shall be able to make sense of this book. 331. You have little sleep that night as you lie thinking about the quest that lies before you, haunted by the fear that the Dark Lords may have already found the Book of the Magnikai. You rise before dawn and breakfast break fast on a meal of sheep's butter and dried milk cake. That doesn't sound good. Before bidding farewell to Tipasa's wife, the trek back to the Sky Rider passes uneventfully, and by noon you've reached the rocky crag where the craft is moored. Nolrim is the first to greet you, but he cannot hide his disappointment that you've returned unaccompanied. Do not worry. The answer lies here, says Banadon, holding up Tipasa's diary. Prepare to set sail! As the Sky Rider rises into the clear blue sky, Banadon hands over the helm to Nolrim and bids you follow him to his quarters at the prow. For three hours, he pours over his charts, marking calculations, checking instrument readings, and racking his brain for the solution that will pinpoint the tomb of Majan. It's no use, he says, tired and exasperated. I cannot fathom these numbers. As you peer at the pages of Tabasa's diary, suddenly you realize they're written in code. What Banadon had assumed to be positions of stars is a code set to three numbers that give the precise locations of the tomb. Consult the map to help you discover the location of the Tomb of Majan. The first three number is equal to the number of oases on the trail between Ikoresh and Birablo. The second number is equal to the number of cities in Vasagonia. The third number is equal to the number of islands off the coast of Cape Kabar. When you've broken the code, write the numbers in order and turn to the entry number that they indicate. So, this is fairly easy if you pay attention. Okay. Number of oases is between Ikaresh and Bir Rablo. One, two, three. Okay, that's easy. That's to page 300. Okay, now how many islands are off the... Okay, so three is going to be the second part. There's three islands up, so... Or the third part. So three something three. Somewhere. So there are somewhere between zero and nine cities. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fifteen. Yeah, that doesn't work. But if you actually read the page, this took me a while. The Empire of Asagonia is a vast desert realm. The northern coast runs roughly east for several hundred miles before it turns in a lazy, rugged arc to the south. Roughly at the apex of this arc is the city of Badakish, the city, capital city of Asagonia. The six other cities of this vast arid country. Bong! So. Barakish and six other cities makes seven. So in theory, we should go to 373. 
That's it! exclaims Banadon, stabbing his finger at a map of the dry main that covers the chart table. One hundred and fifteen miles due west of Beer Rabelo. One hundred and fifteen miles due south of the oasis of Bal Lofton. He picks up a quill pen and marks the spot, the tomb of the Majan. This section is the correct answer. You study the map and ponder the miles of desolation separating you from your goal. Banadon notices your look of dismay and quickly tries to put your mind at ease. Fear not, Lone Wolf. We'll be there before the dawn. You smile at his confidence, but it's not the actual journey that worries you. Your concern is what you may or may not find on your arrival. Whew. It's going to be close. Ooh. Appears to be a bow and arrows. Maybe. Dawn is breaking on the horizon of a low hill, blurred and dotted with small tufted trees. Swiftly the Skyrider has voyaged through the night to arrive at the foothills of the Koneshi Mountains, in whose folds the skyship is safely tucked away from the watchful eyes. Twenty-five miles to the north, across the landscape of barren rock and dry brush, lies the tomb of the Majan. The Koneshi Mountains. Oh, okay, so somewhere in this mess. Actually, fairly close to these idiots. Silly bastards. You and Banadon set off before the dawn, anxious not to waste either time or the protective cover of darkness. Now, as the great golden disk of the sun rises in the sky, for the first time you can see your goal. A massive excavation has exposed the heart of the scorched land, delving deep around the tombs of its forgotten ancestors. Thousands of Gaiacs, spiteful and malicious servants of the Dark Lords, labor unceasingly to remove rock and sand from this quarry. Forced by Dracarim to drag their back-breaking loads up ramps to the rim of the crater. Excuse me. Close to the edge of the crater, an encampment of black tents surrounds a large domed canopy. Lying in the shade of this construction is a huge flying creature, an Imperial's land beast. Its presence here can only mean one thing. Dark Lord Hakon has arrived. The thought chills your blood, but you draw comfort from the labor of his slaves. That they continue to labor is a sign that their mission has yet to be completed. The Book of the Magnikai has yet to be found. <laughs> it is impossible to approach the crater unseen. You will have to wait for darkness before you attempt to enter the tomb. During the long wait, it is agreed that Banadon should attempt to find Tipasa. It is likely he's being held captive inside the encampment. The Dark Lords would be unlikely to kill him before discovering the treasure they seek. During the day, you must eat a meal. You may not hunt in the middle of this wasteland. What are you, retarded? Okay. As night falls, your desperate quest begins. The Gaiacs pose few problems that you cannot overcome with your warrior skills, for they have been overworked to the point of exhaustion. Only the Dracarim show any signs of vigilance, but even then, there are less than a dozen patrolling the entire crater. Not until you reach the main entrance of the tomb do you encounter any real difficulty. A Drakkar stands on guard, his cruel eyes glinting behind his twisted iron death mask. Occasionally, he diverts his attention from the watch to take a drink from his water flask. We do possess mind over matter. You focus your skill on a nearby spade, willing the spade handle to rattle against the wheelbarrow in which it rests. It only takes a few seconds for the vigilant Drakkarim sentry to leave his post and investigate the noise. By the time he returns, you are inside the tomb of the Majan. <sighs> Oh, shit. Are you kidding me? I got rid of both of those. Fudge. Damn it. <laughs> as far as the eye can see, a long, straight sandstone corridor slopes away into the distance. Torches crackle and sputter on the walls, illuminating the pictograms engraved in the yellow stone. At regular intervals, rough-edged slabs protrude into the main corridor. You stop to take a close look at one of these slabs and the floor beneath it and come to a frightening conclusion. They are obviously traps, no doubt set off by the Gaiacs when they cleared this corridor of sand. Rather than instructing the Gaiacs to avoid them, the Dark Lords must have deliberately used their slaves to set them off. Once the traps had been sprung, the squash bodies were cleared away and the slabs chiseled through to the next section. That's horrible! Pit traps on the floor seem to have been neutralized in the same way. Set off by luckless Gaiacs, they would have been filled in with the dead bodies and leveled off with sand. The thought of this heartless barbarity fills you with revulsion. Just over a mile along the corridor, you eventually arrive at a large stone door. 
The stone, the stone surround bears evidence of chisel work, but the door itself is rock solid. You notice a faint beam of light descending from a hole in the ceiling. It creates a small circular pool of light, a little to one side of the similar hole on the floor. In the wall near the door, there's a triangular indentation no larger than a gold crown. I am so pissed right now. The blue stone triangle we received in the caverns of Calte, I think. I can't remember. You, it's where you're supposed to get it. The prism we had and threw it away because it was obviously a red herring. Not like this canteen of water that's seen so much use. Let's see how it goes. Surely the game won't screw me that badly. Oh. Maybe we're okay. You're trying to decide whether to try prizing the door open when you hear the sound of stone grating on stone. The door slowly opens to reveal a large chamber. It is dimly lit, but in the thick dust, which covers the marble floor, you can see innumerable footprints. Then, as you enter, you catch sight of a rough stone throne facing the wall on the far side of the chamber. Behind you, the th stone door slides shut with unnerving speed. Huh. The throne begins to revolve. A towerable howling fills your ears, changing almost instantaneously to the growling of a harsh, guttural language, the likes of which you have never heard before. Words and sounds that the mouths of men could never be shaped to speak roll through the chamber like thunder. It is the Dark Tongue, spoken by Hakon, Lord of Arnak, Dark Lord of Helgadad. He rises from the throne, the ghastly voice still echoing from his unnatural mouth. A spiked fist opens to reveal a glowing stone. Blue flame smolders around its surface, and you can feel the currents of power that radiate from its core. Suddenly his words change, and you hear a tongue you know so well. Psalm lending. Look on your doom, Kai Lord. There's a deafening crack, a surge of power, and a fireball of blue flame hurtles towards your head. You raise your golden sword just in time to deflect the bolt of raw energy. It screams from your blade and explodes into the chamber wall, gouging a hole several feet deep in the steel-hard rock. The impact jars the summer sword from your hand. The blade arcs through the dust-choked air and embeds itself upright in the stone floor. You roll across the floor and take cover behind a pillar. Your doom, Kai Lord, is but seconds away. If you wish to retrieve the summer sword, if you wish to move to a new hiding place under cover of the swirling dust, if you wish to stay where you are. Shit. Uh, no. Also probably no. But we need it. The Summer Sword's our only defense against magic attacks, so... Go for it! You run half-crouched towards your golden blade, grab the hilt, and continue at full speed toward the cover of another pillar. Suddenly, a burst of energy leaps from the Dark Lord's fist, exploding into the base of the pillar, severing it from the floor. A tremendous roar fills your ears as you are thrown backwards by the shock of the blast. You lose three endurance points. Akon's laugh rises above the crash of the falling stone until your head is filled with an agonized pain. Boop. See, now I've watched Grimmeth do this, and his has a little plus button and some other nice features. I don't know how he has a different one than I do. Very strange. Anyway, um, I do have Mind Shield, so screw you. I think I do. I did. Yeah, there we go. Oh, God. What? No. It, no. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Suddenly the pain subsides, but the onslaught has only just begun. A mist as black as the grave is seeping from Hakon's mouth. Ew. It creeps along his outstretched arm and settles like a cloud in the palm of his upturned hand. Whirling shadow shapes draw into a focus. Wings and tentacles sprout and take form. A curse in the dark tongue shakes the whole chamber as a deadly flood of horror hurtles from his hand. No evade, no, you must win. Just if you win, yeah. It's not undead or anything goofy like that. It's just an awful thing that came from Hakon's mouth. That's delightful. Oh, yeah. It uh, doesn't say anything about Mind Blast, so yes. And then the shield, yes. And the silver helmet, also yes. And so two, four, twelve, Mind Blast, fourteen. Okay, so twenty-nine is correct. Start the combat. Ow. So it, did, it took eleven, we took one. 
another round. It took 18, and that time I rolled pretty bad. And then it died. I took five points. Not terrible. Hmm. Oh, shit. <laughs> I don't think we're done yet. That's a cool picture, though. Is that the Summer Sword? Yay! That's really cool. I don't show very many pictures of it. As you slay the last of the crypt spawn... Oh, there were several of them. Okay. Hagon reels back as if weakened by the death of his creatures. You raise the summer sword, willing the blade to discharge a bolt of power that will burn the evil Dark Lord from the face of Magnamon forever. The blade shimmers with golden fire, but no searing blast issues from its tip. Suddenly you realize what has happened. You are beneath the earth, and there is no sun from which the sword can draw its power. Well, crap. Hakon utters a terrible laugh that shakes the stone floor. A beam of blue flame is growing from the stone in his hand, forming a fiery blade that crackles and spits as it cuts through the dust-choked air. The stench of death and decay fills your nostril as the Dark Lord prepares to attack. By the way, he's using Mind Blast. Of further note, he doesn't have Mind Shield, the goofy bastard. We're also kind of hurt from that crypt spawn. I think it's time to take a lumps for potion. Okay, go for it. Start the combat. Uh, pretty good. He still has a lot more hit points than we do. Ooh, that was a good number. Do that one again. Hey! One more? Holy damn! I rolled a 10. See, if anyone's wondering, 0 is usually a 10. If you look on the combat chart, note how I didn't take any damage. <laughs> He's mostly dead. Damn. Uh, who's the other guy? Baraka? He was tougher than this asshole. We won! We split him in twain. You exam oh, or not. You examine the floor where Dark Lord Hakon fell, but there are no signs of his body. The atmosphere is strangely calm and peaceful, as if a great and evil shadow has been lifted. If you lost the Summer Sword in the confrontation with the Dark Lord, you may now retrieve it, because you could have fought that whole thing without it. Well, that's good to know. Apparently one of those other choices wasn't instant death. You turn and walk to the throne where Hakon sat, waiting for you to appear. Beyond it lies a portal, an ancient inscription carved deep into the blood-red stone. Below the carving is set the impression of a human hand. Instinct and intuition guide your hand to the door. The carving fits around it like a glove. Silently, the portal slides back to reveal your destiny, the Book of the Magna Chi. That would be you. Yep. Set on a pedestal, the book lies open, its secrets revealed to your eyes alone. As you lift the sacred book, the very air throbs with the vibration of the force locked within its sun-golden cover. With a pounding heart, you close the book and hurry from the chamber. By the time you reach the foothills of the Konishi, Benadon has successfully completed his mission. He and Tapasa are waiting for you. As they see you appear clutching the Book of the Magna Chi, they can barely contain their excitement. This night of triumph, says Panadon jubilantly, will herald a new dawn of hope for Summerland. The Kai are reborn. The quest is now over. You have found the Book of the Magna Kai, and freed Magnamon from the shadow of Dark Lord Hakon. But for you, Kai Master Lone Wolf, the story has only just begun. Your destiny lies along the path of the Grand Masters, to learn their secrets, and attempt the first exciting quest of the Magna Kai. Begin your journey with Book 6 of the Lone Wolf series, entitled The Kingdoms of Terror. <laughs> so, um, yeah, give me one second here. Welcome back, everyone. We're on the Lone Wolf Wiki, where I found book covers, which I was going to show you guys off real quick. Uh, first we have, let's see, Lone Wolf, The Flight from the Dark. I don't know why this captivated me when I was little. It just seemed like, I don't know. Seemed like a cool thing. I think we didn't start with Lone Wolf. We started with another one, which for the first couple books, I was actually, my dad and I were actually surprised by how easy they were based on some of the other ones we'd done before. Um, let's see. This is Fire on the Water. This is, I think, the British one. There's Vonatar, the hunchback wizard, shooting fireballs. The American one looked very similar, but I can't find it. Uh, this is Vonatar again in the Caverns of Calte. Another cool book cover. Lots of tentacle cave 
thing. Oh, that's his monster. God, I never realized that. Uh, this should be the Chasm of Doom, which kind of, uh, it mainly focuses around the battle that we fought at the tower. And then here's Shadow on the Sand, where we're flying our magical birdie and kicking that guy in the face. Uh, with a flaming sword, you say. Super Edition, including two adventures, book one and book two. Now, if we go back here, uh, I think I did the Plague Lords of Rule. I remember dying instantly because I had the Summer Sword. A lot of this gets fuzzy. Book 9, I remember. Book 7 was... Book 7 was awesome. That one, I remember being a lot of fun. Uh, Kingdom of Terror, I'm probably going to die a couple times in. That's 6, 7... Which one's 8? That's 13. That's 11. That's 10. I don't see Book 8 anywhere. Oh, here it is. The Jungle of Horrors. That's another terrible one. <laughs> that one is no fun. This is a cool book cover with the, the snake thingy. Um, let's see. Kingdom of Terror is where we're going to be next in ruined lands of dying a lot. Um, let me see. It goes all the way to... Let's see. This is book 17. The Death Lords of Ixia, a Grand Master Adventure. Legacy of Vashna. We haven't seen the last of... Uh, that's a dude's face with tits. I'm going to say it. Uh, Wolf's Bane is one of the ones I don't think I ever got to. And the Curse of Nar might be the last one that we got in America. There's a Hellgast. There's that snake we scared off with the Fire Spear. I don't know what that is. It looks like a heart. I... it's apparently a blood lug. I'm good. There's a guy. Another guy. There's a horrible lizard monster. Lots of horrible lizard monsters, it seems. Bats. Doggies. Great big hand. Giant fist. Dot gif. <laughs> Whoa. More horrible lizard creatures. Our various items. Carrion crawler. I don't think we fought that in mine. That's a shame. There's a piggy. It's probably a Gaiac. There's the graveyard. Always fun. Is that it for that? Yep, that's it for that. Collection of 28 books. So, anyway, I just kind of want to go there. There's Joe Deaver. Cool guy that he is. And what we're going to do... Uh, let's see. Probably not on here. But, if we go to... Project Aeon's main page. We're going to take a break, because we finished the Kai series. We're going to start the Magna Kai series, which is awesome. But I'm going to take a quick break. We're going to do the first book of the World of Lone Wolf, Star the Wizard. There's no action chart, so I'll have to fiddle with stuff and make my own, but I, I think we can do it. And, uh, yeah. Graystar the Wizard is another really cool thing. Let me see if it's on here. Maybe Graystar. Nope. No pictures. That's a shame. Well, I'll see what I can find out for that book, because I remember the covers for that one being pretty cool. Um, there's some neat stuff in it. We'll have uh, magic. We'll be a wizard. We can blow people up with our staff. We'll have a third stat called willpower, which we can spend to really, really tear things up. Um, some new followers, some really difficult combat compared to Lone Wolf and, well, LOL Summer Sword. But, uh, yeah, I hope you guys have enjoyed Book 5. Uh, see me again next time for Book 6. And uh, I'll try and keep busy in the meantime. Uh, you guys have a great uh, whatever day it is, and I'll see you next time. Till then.